Houston, we have a problem. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Real Chat Podcast presents the 100 Greatest Movies. Movie number 89, Shaun of the Dead. Do you ever think that modern life is not for you? Do you do the same dead-end job every day? Is your love life dying on its feet? To a wonderful mom. Oh. Oh. Have you ever felt that you're turning into... Something in the world. A zombie. Maybe you're not alone. He said. Although no one official is prepared to comment, religious groups are calling it Judgment Day. It is vital that you stay in your home. Avoid all physical contact with the assailants. So, what's the plan? Bash him in the head, that seems to work out. Why have we got a girl Lizzie? Because I love her. All right, gay. Okay. Do something! Wait right there. Um, hold it there. I'm oh, coming! Oh. Here they come! <laughs> Everybody, welcome to episode 76 of The Real Chat Podcast, a podcast that promises cinephiles, whether here or abroad, the real world as we know it. Next time I see him, he's dead. Ah, the foreshadowing, the irony, the gut-busting humour. That quote perfectly encapsulates 2004's Shaun of the Dead, the American debut for actors Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, as well as writer-director Edgar Wright. Shaun of the Dead brought a dry form of British comedy to our shores that was universally embraced. Their television show Spaced didn't even hit local store shelves until after the success of their second film, Hot Fuzz. But with Sean, they put their own uniquely fresh spin on a not-too-fresh subgenre, the horror spoof. It's been done a hundred times already, from self-aware horror films to full-on film mix and match fare like Scary Movie, but few such films can claim the same brilliance and appeal as this British take on zombies. More a love letter than full-on parody, Shaun of the Dead took on the living dead in a manner only rivaled by the late master George A. Romero himself. My name is Adam Stolfo. I am a big fan of the zombie genre, I must admit, and I'm joined here by good friend Mr. Andrew McCaskill. Andrew, how are you doing? Yeah, very well. I was just thinking it's um, a relief that Penny Jelly couldn't make it today because she's famously uh, terrified by zombies. But she did tell me during the week, Andrew, that uh, this is the one zombie film that she can handle. Oh, okay. Must be the tone. Yeah. <laughs> Has to yeah. Be. It's more yeah. humor than horror. Indeed. But uh, what about yourself? Would you classify yourself as a fan of this genre? I love my horror films to have comedy in them. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, probably more horror than comedy. Like just uh, the blend is, is uh, this one's all out comedy to me. Yeah, it is. But um, yeah, no, a, a, a laugh and a scream is a good time out. Indeed. Yeah. Rejoining us as well, uh, new semi-regular Mr. Jesse O'Brien. Jesse, how's it going? Hello, good, thanks. I've never been introduced third before, I'm always fourth. You've been brought up the list just for this week. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what about yourself? Are you a fan of this genre? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Horror and comedy are such a perfect mix. Would you make a film like Shaun of the Dead one day? I am scheduled to make one in October, I hope, directing which, a film I didn't write. Which is? It's a horror comedy called Flesh and Blood. Oh, Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's very similar in the vein. It's in the vein of Shaun of the Dead for sure. In fact, the brief was kind of like, can we do a Shaun of the Dead style movie? And I was like, can we make it kind of Jesse O'Brien style as well? <laughs> <laughs> can I put my stamp on it? Exactly. Yeah, that's it. But uh, welcome back, Jesse. Thank you. And uh, joining us as well, our special guest today, uh, Mr. Andy Hazel. Andy, how's it going? Pretty well, thanks, Adam. Thanks a lot for having me along. Last couple of weeks, you've become a bit of a real chat fan. Would I? Uh... I have. I've yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been put onto the chat and been listening back to some older episodes and yeah. very much liking what I'm hearing. For those of you who aren't familiar with Andy, he is a Melbourne-based freelance journalist and editorial assistant at the Saturday Paper. 
And you're also a producer, composer, editor, and actor. Yep. So, jack of all trades there, mate. And uh, specifically featuring in Sarah Lamberg's film, Innuendo, which was recently accepted into the Cannes Film Festival. And we had Sarah on the show when we looked at Lost in Translation a couple of months back. Um, mate, the Cannes Film Festival, which I understand you're going to be attending. I am, yeah. And yeah. not alone, because another one of the people here, Jesse, is also that going. That is right. And this is recent news to me as well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you both are suddenly <laughs> meeting today and going across the Cannes. And uh, we'll, probably, <laughs> we'll probably have something to do with each other while you're over there. Oh, I'll have imagine. to. Because yeah, it's such an unknown for me, not knowing many Aussies going over. It'll be great. Indeed. It's uh, yeah. soon, isn't it? It's, 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 I fly out on Monday. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll fly out later in the week because the Saturday paper needs to be put out. <laughs> I haven't spoken to Sarah directly since this news has come out either, Andy. So, um, but you guys must be wrapped and oh, it's so extremely excited. exciting. Well, she went last year by herself and repped um, at the buyers market there, and now, of course, you know, like a lot of filmmakers, she ends up networking and meeting a whole bunch of other people and getting distributors and stuff like that. So now she goes back this time with me and a couple of other people from the production, and it's all like super supercharged. And so now we've got screenings lined up, and it's. Yeah, the door, lots of doors are opened already. It's an amazing opportunity. Wow. It's going to be crazy. I don't think there'll be much sleep. You'll probably meet some people that you never thought you would as well, you know? Yeah, so. that's already on the cards. Yeah. Indeed. People have, you Jesse. Got, have you got your black suit? Uh, yeah, I've noticed that there's only some screenings you can't attend without a tuxedo. Mm. They actually wow. won't let you on the carpet or in, inside the venue without a tuxedo. Are you guys all ready for that? Are you... <laughs> I'm going this afternoon to H&M and buying a $200 black suit. Nice. Because cool. it's the cheapest one I could find. Ironic <laughs> t-shirt with the tuxedo on it. That <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to expect. Maybe. Yeah. But probably not. Andy, you're also the uh, the host of the Cultural Capital and Twin Peaks The Return podcast. Yeah, I have two other podcasts on the go. Twin Peaks The Return's died down a bit now that the series is finished. Yes. But that was an episode by episode recap that we would record 24 hours after the previous episode. And in summing up the Cultural Capital show as well? Yeah, huh? that's a fortnightly Melbourne-based uh, podcast. It looks at films that have just opened up in Melbourne, films that are screening at the at Acme or the Astor or somewhere like that, and we also do a film diary. And we count our top three. So in the coming week, we're looking at this movie, Trench, that's a local production, which is a noir movie. Yeah, yeah. right. And we're counting our top three neo-noirs, and we have interviews with the director and star of that. So that sort of thing. Because there's so much going on in Melbourne, man. You need to kind of document it or it just disappears. From what I've heard of the show, yeah, it's mm. great listening. Yeah, well, thank de- you. Definitely. You also have, <laughs> on a side note, Andy, you also have your top, your or your own top 100, yeah, which yeah. you sent to me. I'm glad you used that website, by the way, because more film fans should yeah, use Letterboxd. Letterboxd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, It's a really good <laughs> film, um, the, the Diary and everything that you can use on that so you can keep track of what you've seen yeah because i used to manage yeah. a dvd store called video dogs and yeah. people would come in asking for recommendations all the time so we ended up just having our staff lists of our top 100 films and it became yeah. this thing that now seems kind of nerdy but yeah so back a, then was quite useful a very different top 100 from this that's for sure i do yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> does that take you forever to, to compile not really i've kind of just been working at it away for the last few years yeah <laughs> no, it actually goes up to 360 now yeah. it's a bit nuts <laughs> jesse do you use letterboxd wow. uh well yes my dad's a big fan he yeah. has so many reviews oh, on there, as you know, because he's a recent Real Chat fan. That. Your dad has started interacting on the uh, yeah. the Real Chat social. Uh, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's also he's so supportive of everything I do. Yeah, um, but he genuinely likes Real Chat as well now. I now know he's discovered it. But I yeah, can tell. He, yeah, he's got me into it because I I used to do a film blog myself online, and I just got too busy. I stopped doing it, but I reviewed every single film that I saw for a two year period. So I've started translating those across into Letterboxd just to have them there instead of yeah. my old outdated blog. Yeah, I, I tried to go back in time on it, Andy, and I tried to like, you know, anything that I that I can remember seeing in my lifetime, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tried to document on the website that I had seen it Yeah, uh, yeah, just, yeah good. just for, you know, my own purposes and then tried to give everything a star rating. It's nearly impossible. It is. Yeah, it gets crazy. Uh, <laughs> it did, yeah, there's I Check Movies as well, which is another cool. thing that's much more list focused than okay. Letterboxd, which yeah. is kind of useful too for taking things off. Good stuff. Well, let's talk about uh, Shaun of the Dead, guys. So, this episode is part of our 100 Greatest Movie series based on Empire Magazine's 2017 article of the same name. So, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End are all parts of Edgar Wright's Blood and Ice Cream trilogy, also referred to as the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy, or more simply, the Cornetto trilogy. Uh, Essentially, this trilogy features three movies that involve blood and ice cream. However, in terms of plot and characters, the three films are completely unrelated. Prominent are many references in this film to George A. Romero's earlier dead films, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and Day of the Dead, with Dawn in particular being referenced, obviously with the name of this film as well. The film sort of revolves around Sean, who lives a supremely uneventful life, which revolves around his girlfriend, his mother, and above all, his local pub, the Winchester. This gentle routine is threatened when the dead return to life and make strenuous attempts to snack on ordinary Londoners. What are some of your initial thoughts 
on this film. I'll start over here with you, Andrew. Um, Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, I um, haven't seen it for a little while, and um, yeah, I always kind of had fond memories of it. It was always a very funny film. Uh, this time around, it was enjoyable, but probably not as much as I, I recall. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was, I don't know, it just seems like it's not dated, I don't know if that's the right word, but it just, uh, the appeal of it has lost me, left me a little bit. Maybe I'm becoming a bit more miserable in life, in old, older age, but I just, <laughs> I'll wear but, that uh, with pride. Yeah, but um, I mean, this, this film was released during the, like this big zombie resurgence, wasn't it? Like there mm. were a lot of zombie-esque projects released in this time. I remember there was an Australian film called Undead, Jesse, yeah. released around this time. I can't remember the exact year, maybe a bit later. I think it was just it was around this time, yeah, the Spirit yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Back yeah. In the day. A film of two halves, I found. I, I really enjoyed the first half and thought that the second half was pretty ordinary. Anyway. It was a but, great- uh, Yeah, it was, it, was your, yeah. it was your average Aussie first feature, which, can, ha- which has to be scrappy because of the yeah. nature of our industry, but it was a great effort, and they went on to become great filmmakers. Indeed. I love yeah. their stuff. I, I would agree with you to some extent, Andrew. I, I, I think I still very much enjoy it as much as I did back in 2004 when it came out. Yeah. It's amazing that it's already 14 years old, isn't it? It is frightening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed. What about- Yourself, Andy. What, um, what are your initial thoughts? Well, I was living in the UK around the time that Spaced was on TV, so I had kind of discovered it as everybody around me was, and it was a phenomenon. Like people would quote from it all the time. The next day after seeing it at clubs or bars or whatever you'd go, it was such a big part of culture. So everybody was kind of very switched on to Edgar Wright and what he was doing. So it was a huge big amount of hype over there for when Shaun of the Dead came out. So it was almost like a, a cult success before it had even existed. And so I was kind of I was very much associated with seeing it at the time in 2004 and. Rewatching it now, yeah, it was interesting because it so much acknowledges film history. Like, there's so many nods, so much pop culture references, so many you know things that the more you've watched horror, the more you're going to get out of it. And now, 14 years later, you can go, oh yeah, that person, that person, that person, and then all these. Th- there's so much foreshadowing in the film itself that's almost culturally foreshadowing too, because there's so many zom rom coms you know have come Indeed. into existence since this film. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'd agree with that, definitely. Jesse, I remember vividly when it came out because yeah, it was so fresh here in Australia as opposed to the UK where Empire Magazine, I remember they did a write-up about this, yeah, this romantic zombie comedy and from these unknown British people that we didn't know. Uh, but it's just amazing from that point, they've been so known. And it was a start of a trajectory where they're so ingrained in pop culture. Edgar Wright, Nick Frost, Simon Pegg, they're all, they're all they're Star Trek, Star Wars. They're in so much now. And that was the beginning of it. And for me, it ramped up from there. I've loved them ever since. Yeah, this, there's no doubt that this film is part of that, you know, it's catering to the film nerd, isn't it? Oh, you know what I mean? Sure. Like for with sure. the amount of references and mm-hmm. it really is like, you know, something else. And that, that's something that's not aging as in like, it's still impressive what they were able to The power achieve. of the nerd. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of come out. And, and it's a certain kind of British humor that I think has really taken off. It's a, a kind of modern, you know, humor. I mean, I think they've obviously like the kind of Monty Python thing has been, they've written the coattails of that for a long time. And, and this is a new kind of fresh generation of humor that came through with this film. Yeah. yeah, and it's quite different to Peter Jackson's stuff that he was doing in the decade before as well. Where he was managing to mix horror and comedy, but in a totally different way and mm. almost without the same sort of influence, almost pointedly without those same sort of influences that Wright used. And it's kind of impossible to talk about this film without the Cornetto trilogy, I guess, as well. Oh, no, you have to link them yeah. all together. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is a classic trilogy now, I think. It was released on the 9th of April 2004 in the UK and the 24th of September 2004 in the US and then the 9th of October 2004 in Australia. It was shot in England and the UK, entirely in London on location and at Ealing Studios. Many exterior shots were filmed in and around the North London areas of Crouch End, Muswell Hill, Finsbury Park and East Finchley. The scenes filmed in and around the Winchester Tavern were shot at the Duke of Albany pub in New Cross, South London a three-story Victorian-style pub. Unfortunately, it was turned into flats in 2008, Andrew, which a little part of me always dies inside when I hear about iconic film locations no longer being with us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just a little bit. But um, It had a budget of an estimated $6.1 million, so not much at all, even by 2004 standards, and it grossed $30 million worldwide. So you guess that's quite a success, isn't it? You know? Totally. Yep. Good effort. Um, the director of the film, we have touched upon him. He is Edgar Wright. Now... Edgar Howard Wright is an English director, screenwriter, and producer. He began making independent short films before making his first feature film, A Fistful of Fingers. Has anyone seen this film? 
A lot really? of excerpts from it. Have you? I never watched it. I don't know where to get it or see it, but it, yeah, it's it's very much so, a student film. So, it's not in general release. Like a teenage film more. So. Okay, it's not in any- No, I don't think it got a release. Okay. No, it sounds like something that would be a bonus feature. Yeah. But yeah, it's his own personal project. Wright created and directed the comedy series Asylum in 1996, written by David Williams from uh, Little Britain. After directing several other television shows, Wright directed the sitcom Spaced. In 1999 to 2001, which aired for two series and starred frequent collaborators Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Has any of you guys seen Spaced? I have not seen that. I have. Yeah? Well, very much so, yeah. Jesse, have you seen it? I recently started watching it on right. Stan. Right. What can you tell us, Andy? Well, it's pretty much about share house living, and it, but it goes into all these extremely fantastical and kind of parodic and really, really inventive sort of tangents. So a lot of the stuff that we see early on with the character building where they're sharing, these three unlikely people are sharing a place of residence is very much, you know, stems from that. It embraces nerd culture, has a lot more pop culture references than the Cornetto trilogy, which is kind of hard to believe sometimes. Yeah. But no, seriously, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and a lot of the cast as well, is that right? A lot of yeah, the- exactly, yeah, yeah, almost everybody. So actually, if you've watched Space, there are some relationships in Shaun of the Dead that become a little deeper because it, in a way it could be what happened after Space finished right. in a way because it's, you know, various romantic tensions and that sort of stuff. There is an episode which involves zombies, and yeah. I think this is kind of stemmed from that. In 2004, Wright directed the first film in the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy, Shaun of the Dead, which was followed by Hot Fuzz in 2007 and The World's End in 2013. In 2010, Wright co-wrote, produced, and directed the comedy action film Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Along with Joe Cornish and Steve Moffat, he co-wrote Steven Spielberg's The Adventures of Tintin in 2011, and Wright and Cornish co-wrote the screenplay for the Marvel Cinematic Universe film Ant-Man, in 2015, which Wright intended to direct, but abandoned, citing that famous quote, uh, Jesse, creative differences, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which you hear way too often. Um, His latest film, the action comedy Baby Driver, was released last year as well, a film that I still haven't actually seen, but... Yeah, it's a solid film. Yeah? Definitely agree. I had some (laughs) different... Andrew, who would have thought? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, a bit overrated that one for me, but um, okay, yeah. very much, uh, I guess, the, the, the pinnacle of his success so far. Yeah, look, he, he's made some very entertaining films. I mean, Hot Fuzz was certainly uh, another one of his, which was very enjoyable. Is that the standout of the, you know, the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy? I, th- you know? I haven't seen the third one in the trilogy, but- Oh, um, yeah, right. I, I think Shaun of the Dead is, is the best one of the three for Okay, me. yep. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, look, he's a, he's a really entertaining uh, director. I think the consensus is that Hot Fuzz is the best, I think. I think that is a general consensus. Yeah. For me, they're all great in different ways. Agreed. I agree yeah. with that. And I, I, I think in, in terms of Edgar Wright in general, I think his magic element is the, is these two guys, is Nick Frost and Simon Pegg, because as much as I enjoy Baby Driver and Scott Pilgrim, they're really, really well done and really clever, but the marriage of Edgar Wright's direction and their two performances is just perfectly gelled. So you think that these three movies are the highlight of Edgar Wright? For me, if I want to sit down and enjoy Edgar Wright, I'll go to one of these three, yeah. Okay. Yep. What about yourself, Andy? Would yeah, you I've been a huge fan. Yeah, always. Um, Even stuff like The World's End, which I feel was a weaker effort, and I think it's kind of widely regarded as being the weaker of the three. Even, the, even There's even some gold in, in that. Yeah. There is. But I think one yeah. really good thing to point out, um, we'll probably come to it again, is that even though he like, embraces this nerd culture and these, mass, these male friendships and he explores them really well, it's never done in an exclusivist way. There's always something there for people who, even if you, you know, you're not a dude, <laughs> I yeah. think there's like still a wealth of enjoyment to be had with these films. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, we always make mention of the director cameos as well, guys. Um, he actually appears in this film. Uh, during the Remembering uh, Z-Day montage, there is a long shot of the zombies walking through a park. Edgar is the one in the black who falls over himself. Um, he also makes a voice cameo as the host of Fulci's Italian restaurant in this film as well. So I like when directors work their way in there, like very subtly. The writers of this film, Edgar Wright uh, also wrote the film along with Simon Pegg himself. So the film was inspired by the spaced episode in particular called Art, which was written by Pegg along with his writing partner and co-star Jessica Stevenson. And it was directed by Wright in which the character of Tim who Peg plays, under the influence of amphetamine and the video game Resident Evil 2, (laughs) hallucinates that he is fighting off a zombie invasion. Having discovered a mutual appreciation for Romero's Dead trilogy, they decided to write their own zombie movie, and Space was to be a big influence on the making of Sean, 
as it was directed by Wright in a very similar style and featured many of the same cast and crew in minor and major roles. So do you guys have any thoughts on this screenplay? I'll start here with you, Jesse. First of all, that's like the third episode of Spaced. Yes. Yeah, 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 so really I one. just watched it and I didn't realize that was the one because it has zombies, but it's not all about zombies. But I did notice the parallel for sure. Yeah. It's a very similar style. They were doing it well then. The screenplay is, to me, comedy perfection. It's yeah. just so perfectly timed and but also so perfectly tied to the performers. Yep. You could take the script and give it to other people and it wouldn't necessarily be as good because they just take it to that extra level. But it's just structurally, it's great. The dialogue is so pitch perfect. It's just so snappy and witty. It does have so many pop culture references, but it doesn't hinge everything on them. It, like Edgar Wright and, and, and Peg, they really understand. You can't say that for comedy. all filmmakers, can you? No. 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 It seems to be right on the mark. So, Andy, thoughts on the script? Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's also a really deceptively well-written piece because it's so conversational and so many lines seem to be throw away. And the second time you watch, you're like, oh, actually, that is a foreshadowing X, Y, and Z. And so, it's been extremely well thought through. And I think, yeah, you're right. I think so much of what works so well in this film, at least for me, is because of the relationships that Wright has built around him. So, he's been able to draw from this incredible wealth of comic talent. That if even just for tiny roles, you know, there's people, you know, who went on to have huge careers who are delivering like just absolute gold, you know, just for a few seconds of screen time. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think this, I think the reason he could get so much goodwill out of the English comedy scene at the time is because this script was such a winner. Andrew, thoughts on the script? Yeah, um, I think probably the tone is probably the, the the real thing for me. I just think it's such a hard thing to to blend horror and comedy and get that that mix right, and it, it's it's exceptional in that in that regard. It's funny, isn't it? Because these guys make it look really easy. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah, but, and that's the genius. That's, of that it. is the genius. Literally. But you're right; it's not easy at all. No, and, and no. just you know, making the mundane, you know, cross come in with the the absurdness of of zombies. You know, just making it believable, but then again, at the same time, making it farcical. That probably leads us nicely into the cinematographer, Andrew, um, because uh, before we just talk about the, the cinematography, I have to bring up that shot at the, the first day of the zombie invasion, I suppose, mm. um, when Sean walks to the corner store and doesn't notice zombies on the streets and corpses all over the place. Um, the way that, that scene is shot in one massive, long, continuous take, yeah, yeah. it's so effective. Well, that's that's like, the, the the standout point, isn't imagine it? Imagine the setup time for that. Like yeah. The payoff when you when you pull it off that you know that well. You and know it's not I mean? showy like, at, at all. Like no, it's, it's not showy. It's that wonderful British kind of like you know just it's it, 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 nothing. There's no pretentious quality to it. It's just kind of using it in a really clever, yeah. comedic way. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, the cinematographer is David M. Dunlop. Yes. Um, familiar with any of his work? Or? No, it's not a lot I, I could really find on him. He's done a lot of TV work, a lot of work in uh, second unit for uh, for major films, uh, a lot of camera operation as well. So he's, he's more, perhaps more of a technician um, than, you know, the, a standalone cinematographer, I think. So, yeah, he's done, you know, I mean, he's worked on films like Forrest Gump and A Beautiful Mind uh, in the second unit. So he's been involved in some major productions. And yeah, done a, most of his uh, cinematography work has been in TV, uh, like the House of Cards being the most recent kind of standout. So yeah, I mean, in, in, this, in terms of this film, um, you know, apart from that sequence, um, the, the one take to the, uh, the milk bar, or the what do you call it, the offie in, uh, in, in London. <laughs> um, yeah, like it's, it's a very, it's very, uh, what would you call it? It's, a, it's not a showy cinematography at all. Like it doesn't, it's not really about the visuals as such. It's the comedy is, is king. So there's some great shots in this film though. Yeah. You and, know, and, but- and with comedy as well, again, like the space and the way you use it is, is such an important element and the way it, they, they, they shoot this, this film and the gags that are, that, that are sold. Yeah. It's all in the way that the, the camera's located. That's yeah. it. I think one of the distinctive things about uh, his work here is whip pans. Yeah. They're actually quite deceptively difficult to do, mm. and he pulls them off over and again and really, really well. And so I think that's maybe one thing that came through with the time pressure you have working in TV is that you've got to, got to nail X, Y, and Z by the end of the day. And so here they had a, a fairly short shoot. I think it was like six weeks or something. It wasn't so, long. Yeah. And so, so much of the comedy comes from a whip pan and then being perfectly in focus and then a line delivery, and he seems to pull that off really, really well. What about yourself, Jesse? Thoughts on the uh, the way this film looks? Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of its brilliance is is what the camera is doing all the time. Um, American comedy often just points the camera at the comedians and lets the comedians do the work and just, you know, just sits there. But this, the camera is so involved in all of Edgar Wright's stuff and, it, you know, it's always moving with them to, like, the timing is perfect with the yeah. camera work. Beyond just whip pans, little crash zooms and just yeah. perfectly timed. And it's like he knows exactly how it's going to be edited together because the, the shots are all designed for the edit. And that's what I love. It's also intentional. The film's cast features a number of British comedians, comic actors, and sitcom stars, most prominently from Spaced, Black Books, and The Office. So we start with Sean Riley. 
is apparently his surname somewhere in the movie. I haven't quite seen it myself, but apparently there's one shot in the film which tells you what his surname is, even though he's never referenced as Riley. <laughs> so Sean Riley's played by Simon Pegg. So we'll start off with him, guys. So thoughts on him, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I mean, we were saying before, like I didn't really know much about him and it wasn't, you know, savvy to his uh, TV history but um he, he just kind of exploded in the in the noughties didn't he, he did this film obviously was the key and yeah like he's just the most unlikely kind of leading man <laughs> he yeah. just doesn't have much of a presence or, or look about him but that's part I think of what that's he's, the whole thing they're going for isn't no, it totally yeah. like he's just like the, your average joe and um yeah he, he had a lot of work in in the noughties as, as a result of this film and yeah, he's got a great comedic delivery, definitely. And now he's in Mission Impossible films? Yeah, like he's in, he's in Geek Heaven now. He's done Star oh. Trek. Is, is he involved in Star Wars to some degree? He's well, yep. he does some voice yep. work. Yeah, and Ready Player One. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's, he's, he's huge now. Absolutely major, major player. He's all over. I love that gag at the in the uh, the early scene where he's the like uh, the supervisor because people have called in sick to his work and there's an age gag in there. That's it. And no... Phone's off here, it's not a social gathering. You're yeah, all right, keep your air on, granddad. Hey, hey, whoa, I'm 29 for Christ's sakes. How old are you, 20, 21? 17. Hey, well, look, I know you don't want to be here forever. You know, I've got things I want to do in my life. When? That's the thing about Simon Pegg. He always has looked older, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Very self-deprecating. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah. I heard an interview with him on the Empire podcast recently where he was saying that before Ready Player One, he wanted to take a break because he'd been working so much. And he said to his agent, don't call me unless Spielberg calls. Jok <laughs> joking. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And he'd obviously worked with Spielberg slightly on, on Tintin. But then Spielberg called- and his agent rang and he's like, this better be Spielberg. And it yeah, was it about was. Ready Player One. So, yeah, he would be in Geek Heaven for God, sure. He'd, be, he'd feel so lucky, wouldn't he? Oh, yeah. Totally. Playing a geek god even. Yeah. As well yeah. as a designer of a computer game. Thoughts to add on Peg? Uh, Andy? Not especially. Yeah. I mean, he was just so ordinary. There was a spate, I suppose, in the early 2000s where there was the people like that could really just be elevated. Like, I mean, Martin Freeman, you know, came along shortly afterwards with not bags of charisma, but just like really, really approachable and really, you know, because a lot of it was really cool, easy to build empathy with somebody like Peg, I think, because he's kind of always a bit overwhelmed by his circumstances. Relatability yeah. as well. Like, yeah. you know, go to the pub and just talking about movies and stuff. I mean, everyone just can, can embrace that. And really taking for granted his relationship, and you know, <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so many, so many great comedic moments. Um, and then of course there's um Nick Frost who plays Ed. How's this, guys? He allegedly kept his genitals shaved throughout the production to create a genuine need to scratch that that character demanded. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Jesus. you can see Nick Frost doing that, couldn't you? <laughs> you can tell fake right. scratching. You can tell. <laughs> yep. So Sean and Ed's friendship is based on Simon Pegg and Nick Frost's uh, when they shared a flat together, and that definitely comes through in the film. Now, am I right in the understanding that Nick Frost wasn't actually an actor as well before this film? Oh, uh, he was in Spaced before that. Before I mean, that, I'm not sure. Know, yeah, like, never, yeah, that was the first time I ever come across him. It does. He does has that feel about it where he's like Simon Pegg might have just brought his mate in to play this role yeah. because no one else could play it. You know what I mean? That's why um, it works so well. That's why it works yeah. so well. But he's he's really really good. Yeah, you I mean, know, has like he, has he done much away from Pegg? He headlined a film called Yeah, it's about it, dancing, it, about dancing. dancing or something. It was some pun about yeah Cuban music, but it wasn't. And, oh, Oh, I really want the name because it's a it's a fun, it's a Cuban fun Fury is that the one? Cuban oh, Fury yeah, that's you. it that's it yeah, yeah. and, the and other, I don't know how well it did the not, other very, not very well no not very well <laughs> spoiler alert yeah the other film as well is um with Peg uh, is the oddball in this series I guess which was Paul you guys remember that oh yeah the alien one yeah yeah so that was like I'd an American. They took these two British guys and put them in this American comedy, which is pretty good sort of love a love letter to but, Close Encounters yeah in a way as it, well it was pretty funny. It's just, it's, yeah, it's, for, it's, for me, that lacked the other magical oh, element, which was Edgar Wright. Of course. Seeing them go off on their own without him. Yeah, it definitely so, Something's missing for me. It definitely lacked something, yeah. Mm. But, um, but yeah, any other thoughts on Nick Frost in this film, guys? I mean, pretty much, he just, he nails what he's asked to do, mm -hmm. doesn't he? So. Love his uh, orangutan impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Any favourite monkey? Shall I do flies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
what's he, what's the what's Kriya Serenifovic uh, yeah. say? Fuck a doodle do. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But doesn't it feel? He feels like a character who you know we would write into a film when we were making films in high school, doesn't he, Andrew? Yeah, you know what I mean. Just the the couch like, dwelling bum. You I know? just love the moments like where he starts playing the slot machine in the midst of the. Zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the Winchester and stuff, you know? Yeah. Or just, and his classic, like, you know... Oh, I'm sorry, Sean. It's all right. No, no. I'm sorry, Sean. Oh! <laughs> oh, my God, that's rotten! I'll stop doing them when you stop laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pause. <laughs> so then, many yeah. recurring lines. Oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah. almost feels like his advice, like, okay, this scene has run its course. What are we going to do to get out of this? Oh, we'll have Ed do something stupid. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah then, totally. Absolutely. And just yeah. the last shot in the film as well with him playing um, PlayStation in the shed. Like, you know, it just, it seems so appropriate for this film, doesn't it? It does. And it was sort yeah. of a redemption because when they killed him off, yeah. I was sort of like, oh, don't kill oh, him no. off. Don't I want to see die. him together again in the sequel <laughs> that they talked about that never happened. Yeah, we will talk a little bit about yeah. that at the end as well, uh, Jesse. But um, let's move on to um, Kate Ashfield, who plays Liz. Yeah. Any uh, <laughs> Anything to add there, Andrew? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, she's she's not a major presence in the in the film, but um, no, not really. Yeah, I mean, she serves, uh, I guess, a purpose in terms of the, I guess, the the love story and the and the heart of the uh, of the character uh, of Simon Pegg's character. I think her chemistry with Peg is very good. They oh, totally. Do feel like they would be together. Oh, yeah, and she's Who got knows, a, yeah, so. very natural kind of performance. You know, it's just it's uh, they've got history, and she's tiring of him and it's yeah it's it's a, it's a strong performance for it's a small role. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thoughts, Jesse? Yeah, not much to say more about her. She did she did it well. She wasn't particularly standout, wasn't particularly likable, but you could believe that they had been together for so long and that's why she was sort of not particularly chirpy or yeah. romantic because yeah. she's sort of done with this guy. Yeah. But she, she has to get stick any by him. She didn't get standout moments in the film, did she, to kind of really make herself known? No. Uh, other than her constant phone messages. Yeah, yeah. She could also handle herself, you know, when it comes to killing zombies. She can, you know- mm-hmm move stuff forward i think she was she did more than she the story wanted her to which was purely to be like a, a prompt for sean to try and grow up and try and leave this lifestyle behind which i think is a lot of what the actual fear in this film is about is about you know growing Change. up and becoming an adult and all yeah. sort of stuff yeah and she's you know more mature than him and trying to pull him along so that comes across as a bit needy and clingy maybe in some messages but also i think she's kind of reasonable in a lot of the things she's asking as well mm. Mm. yeah no there's no there's no doubt that the, the two main female influences in sean's life uh, do play significant parts in this film yeah even though they don't like have a huge amount of screen time. Yeah. Lucy Davis plays Diane in mm-hmm. the film. She's I the- found her irritating. Yeah, yeah me you're too. Right. The me two, too. The two of them were both irritating. I don't her. know if it was just the yeah. delivery. Like her, I don't know if it was, maybe she was overdubbed or something, but every time she spoke, I found well, it really hard to understand. Like her, her delivery was really staccato and yeah. it just kind of jarred. I mean, she's, I loved her in the office. She's just oh, fantastic yeah. in the office, but I, I don't know. There's something about this performance. It was maybe just the delivery was just, uh, just, just jar with is me. That, is that maybe more to do with the writing or the character? Or I don't know what it is. It just it just it took me out a bit of the film because it just seemed a bit too much, just too affected or something. Yeah. Any other thoughts on uh, Lucy Davis, guys? Not really. Mm, I thought they, that couple did a good job of emphasising a slight class difference, which is gargantuan if you live and you've been brought, raised in the UK. Like the, oh, just yeah. the manner they were talking about the "I don't feel you need a car and when you live in London" sort of stuff. I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would. It feels very real. Definitely in the UK, that got huge laughs. Over here, I don't think it would quite, you know, land the same. Yeah, my my wife is uh, is English, and right. uh, yeah, she watched it with me last night, and um, yeah, th- those kind of moments definitely uh, strike a chord. No doubt about that. <laughs> definitely, and um, comedian Dylan Moran plays David in the film. Um, yeah, I mean. <laughs> He's a, he's a funny man, Dylan Moran. I don't think that he's one of the funniest characters in this film. He's quite irritating in this film, but yeah. the more you watch the film, you you sort of notice the f- the funny parts more and enjoy him more. The first yeah. time he's quite grating. Yeah. But it's funny how all these minor characters are designed around, really designed about, around Sean. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because po- yeah, these, the, these are the sort of pretentious dinner party friends that he has to put up with and- they're all designed to reinforce his arc, really. Yeah, and his his glorified death as well in this film. It's, ama- is- it's the best. It's the best gag for sure. Well, yeah, but it, it is that that is straight from Day of the Dead, isn't it? Yeah, just the, yeah, being ripped, exactly. ripped apart by a horde of zombies and having all your intestines mm. flying out and stuff. Because why you know, not? Like- it's such a great effect. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the best. But is there another character who deserved this? Probably not. Oh, no, he had he, it coming he, for a long time. He had it coming. <laughs> That's it. Oh, but then she yeah. she follows him into the brink. She's just like no. David, yeah, no. she just, just runs into the horde of zombies. What an idiot! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is quite an extensive supporting cast in Shaun of the Dead, guys. Um, are there any in particular that uh, 
you want to make mention of? Bill Nighy? Yes. I think he does a yeah. huge amount with the tiny amount he's given, as he does in every performance. Oh, of course he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So good. But particularly the conversation in the back of the the, the, the uh, car, the Mercedes, I think. Yeah. Jaguar. Oh, the Jag- Jaguar. Sorry, the Jag- Jaguar. Yeah. The yeah. heart to heart. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's that, quite, quite moving. That, yeah, well, I think going back to that scene that you talked about walking to the shops. Yeah, you've got the horror, you've got the comedy set up straight away yeah. in that one amazing take. And so when stuff like this happens, when people are getting ripped apart and having heart to heart discussions, yeah. it's that doesn't jar quite yeah. so much. How great is that sequence as well? Um, the uh, it's sort of a dream sequence, I suppose, when they're working out what they're going to do. So, what's the plan? Right. We take Pete's car. We drive over to Mum's. We go in, we take care of Philip. I'm so sorry, Philip. Then we grab Mum, we go over to Liz's place, pull up, have a cup of tea, and wait for all this to blow over. Okay. Take Pete's car, go round Mum's, go in, deal with Philip. Sorry, Philip. Grab Mum, go to Liz's, pick her up, bring her back here, have a cup of tea, and wait for all this to blow over. Perfect. Take car, go to Mum's, kill Phil. Sorry. Grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. How's that for a slice of fried gold? The and plan. it's played it, the plan, and, yeah. it's, and it's laid out like three times, and every time they whack, they whack him with the spade or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. it's so well done. You don't see that much, do you? You know what I mean? Like where. They don't just play the gag once. They play it like three times. Yeah. yeah. Where they alter slight things for the different plan. You know, that that, that is great. I, love I think that that's scene. very much their humor. I think that, that's oh, yeah. that they've almost kind of not yeah. created, but it's it's very much an essence of their, their comedy. It always just finishes with Simon Pegg, like winking at the camera. Yeah. Like, yeah. With <laughs> that, or that's whatever. a great like, shot. Great always shot. finish at the pub. Yeah. You know, or happy at the pub. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's great. That's a great sequence. Um, Matt Lucas also appears very, very briefly as Cousin Tom. I don't mm. know if you guys noticed that. I'm a big Matt Lucas fan from um, from Little Britain, so uh, mm-hmm. yeah. pretty much everyone in this film has gone on to bigger, not bigger and better things, but they, they've, their career has been made. I think Coldplay members Chris Martin oh, yeah. and Johnny Buckland also that was a great, great little gag. Yeah, it was good, yeah. wasn't it? Because that yeah. is what shits me about them. <laughs> <laughs> And it's great, it's great yeah. that they can take the piss at themselves. I think Chris Martin also appears as a zombie in one shot, although he's it, it's very hard to see. Isn't yeah. it? Like he's there. Or, yeah, or, I've or never spotted it. It's a blink and you miss type yeah. of thing. Uh, I haven't found it either, So, but just, just what I heard mm-hmm. doing some research for this. No, but, I think uh, one thing I noticed interesting with the zombies was actually you can see how many of them came from Space Fan Club at the time. Yeah. Because they put that shout out, like, who wants to be a zombie in this movie we're making? And so there's a lot of like, quite stylish young Londoners in their mid-20s who turned out to be zombies, which is not that representative really of that part of London, but made for great cinema. Oh, it definitely did, yeah. without a doubt. <laughs> um, I found this quite difficult with this film, guys, but uh, do you have a favourite scene in Shaun of the Dead, Andrew? Oh, if it's that with me. Um... <laughs> I took time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> One, I just love the setup at the start when they're in the pub, and it just it, it lays out the the dynamic between he and his girlfriend, he and his mate, and the couple that kind of irritate him. And they're all in the same room, and they're talking about each other. And it's, the camera swerves to you know yeah. all in a shot of the conversation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just great. sets up the whole <laughs> conundrum of that relationship perfectly. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's great filmmaking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So so the opening is a standout. Yeah, yeah. Andy. Yeah, I, go, I have to go with that one tracking shot we've already talked about quite boringly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it is, it, does, it is such a pivotal scene. And it's so instantly, you know, classic now. It's like such an amazing piece of cinema from that era. It's such a, you know, ev- evocative piece. Um, there, are quite, there are a few more, like, funnier parts, I guess. Like, we're, we're, with Ed driving the Jaguar. That oh, sort of yeah. stuff. Like, you know, we, we actually get what? a bit of location and you get a bit of the tension of the zombies around. And he's what? just in there chill, like, really chill. Like, way too relaxed, to be Ed honest. Ed crashing yeah. the other uh, car as well yeah, for that's no a, apparent yeah. reason. <laughs> So he can drive the jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which of course happens oh. off, you know, off camera to save money. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great though. Uh, Jesse? Uh, any- probably the backyard scene where they, they meet Mary. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is such a good scene. It's full, it's kind of forgotten, but it's kind of full of all the, like a lot of the press stills, I think, were from that scene and the, yeah. just the look, the digital, the effect looking through the her stomach hole. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a really great gag. Yeah. yeah. It was done so simply. Um, yeah. That's a classic scene. With the Look, records yeah. throwing. Oh, the, yeah, actually, oh, yeah. Thro- throwing the LPs and deciding which ones to throw. Mm-hmm. Now, some of these are limited. Whoa, 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 what was that? Um, I think it was Blue Monday. Man, there was an original press out. Oh, fuck's sake. Hmm. Purple Rain. No. Sign of the Time. Definitely not. The Batman soundtrack. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Oh, Dire Straits. Throw it. <laughs> 
Yeah. And uh, definitely throwing the Batman soundtrack. I, as well, like. I disagree with that. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a good soundtrack. Yeah. Dying Sade. Blue Monday, man. It's original. That is a great scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll talk in, in a second, guys, about the slow zombies that this film adopts as well, because mm. it allows for so many more gags yep. with the slow zombies as well. So it was definitely a good call. There's been confusion with this film, apparently, on whether Sean is actually a parody of Dawn of the Dead. The name is a parody, there's no doubt about that. But due to the film being released very close to the Dawn of the Dead remake mm. in 2004, Zack Schneider's best film, Jesse, by far, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it pe- could be argued, yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, people often presume it to be a spoof of that film. Um, although both movies came out within weeks of each other in the UK, Sean was actually forced to be held back to avoid confusion, apparently. There is no connection whatsoever. Uh, both films were in production before the people involved knew about the others, and so the similar times is a pure coincidence. The only reference to the Dawn of the Dead remake is made on the bonus materials of the Shaun of the Dead DVD and Blu-ray. In the plot holes section, Simon Pegg explains how his character managed to stay out of the hands of the undead because the undead are very slow. The zombies in Dawn of the Dead remake in another zombie film at the time, 28 Days Later, can run like crazy, mm. which is obviously a big thing that they did to try and change the zombies to be a little bit more threatening yeah. in that era. But let me tell you what, I am, as a zombie fan, I am a big, big fan of the slow zombie. Mm-hmm. This, <laughs> this film takes slow zombie to a whole new level for gag purposes, mm-hmm. but I mean- how long it takes the two zombies in the backyard to get to them when they're throwing the LPs at them. They're essentially just shuffling at a very slow pace. Yeah, the speeds um, change depending on the needs of the script a little bit. Yeah, but it's it works perfectly in this film. Um, but I understand the appeal of the fast zombie, like the 28 days later zombie in that. But I am glad that Shaun of the Dead decided to go down the, the slow route. Mm-hmm. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's just it's just a direct homage to Romero. Like it they, is. They wouldn't have had it any other way being fans of Romero. They oh, yeah. It has to be the same style as Zombie. But just allows for those gags, like when they're coming back from the pub drunk and they start doing the... Like, Another classic uh, scene, yeah. That's a great shot as well with the yeah. lighting, like yeah. the way that they light that zombie, the way that the zombie's in um, shadow. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's this light source from behind them, yeah. you know? like Yeah, yeah. Exceptionally, exceptionally well done. Oh, yeah. The film doesn't really sort of directly address this, but why do you guys think that the dead reanimated in this film? <laughs> oh, God, that's a good question. I never even thought yeah. of that. Yeah. That's what I love about but- zombies and- and a lot of sci-fi and horror films, the, the context doesn't matter. It's the situation the characters in that the matters oh, and how yeah. we react as humans to these scenarios. It doesn't matter yeah. where they came from, just matters what we do in them. The movie purposefully never reveals the reason for this, just as the reason is never revealed in Romero's dead film. So mm. there you go, Jesse. Uh, countless theories are dropped throughout the film, however, if you if you pay attention. Uh, number one, a news report can be heard talking about radiation from a downed satellite. Mm. This is in a reference to Night of the Living Dead, in which it is heavily implied that the dead have risen due to radiation from a satellite reactivating the brain. Number two, a newspaper article seen briefly blames the problem on genetically modified crops. <laughs> this is a reference to Do Not Speak Ill of the Dead, a.k.a. Breakfast at the Manchester Morgue from 1974, something I've never heard of. Okay. Um, is that a book or film or? A film, okay. uh, which uses the same foodborne related reason. Right. Okay. And then number three, a radio newsreader says, claims that the virus was spread by rage infested monkeys has now been dismissed as bullshit. (laughs) This is a reference to 28 Days Later from a couple of years before, obviously, in which a rage-inducing infection is derived from freed lab monkeys. And in addition, many newspaper articles and news reports suggest it's a virus. Surprise, surprise. Uh, The fact that the transformation is spread through bite wounds, which happens to Pete, Philip, and Ed in this film, also strongly suggest an infective agent. It is most likely that whatever caused the dead to rise in the, in the Romero world is the reason in this film too, uh, as the zombies follow Romero rules. However, even he doesn't actually know why the dead have risen in his own films. <laughs> so <laughs> it's safe to say that the makers of Shaun of the Dead don't either. And let's be honest, it's not really important, is it? No. You know? So what exactly happened to Diane in the film, guys? She met a demise, surely. Yeah, that well, she would have been shredded. This but- is explained- in the plot hole section of the DVD and Blu-ray, apparently. After she ran out of the Winchester to avenge the death of David, <laughs> she climbed up a tree where she passed out. She woke up days... <laughs> I think she, I've read this, actually. She woke up days later to find no one. She stayed in the tree, eating David's leg to survive. Uh, she eventually got out after learning that the crisis had passed. 
She now lives with her aunt, but remains in Christmas card contact with Sean and Liz. Apparently. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I should have so, shot that. That would have been quite funny. Yeah, but she said, and then credits kind of little yeah, yeah. extra. So yeah, she doesn't die. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> I remember seeing, and it's, I don't know if anyone else can back me up on this, a full page ad in a copy of Empire just after the film came out in America with a quote from Tarantino saying, this is the best film I've seen this year and any year in the future in which I watch Shaun of the Dead, that will be the best film of this year. And I can't find it anywhere online. So I'm not sure if I'm hallucinating it. Or no, I've heard that. You have? Great. Okay. No. I'm it's, not, good to know. It's, yeah, he definitely holds it in higher regard. I wonder if he still feels like that in 2018. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> me, I, me either. Yeah. I wonder how, uh, that's high praise though. Yeah. yeah. I wonder how much that praise propelled the film's popularity. If that helped its campaign. Surely. surely. Yeah, well, in the have. States, at least, I guess it helped get, get that 30 million gross. Yeah. Get a good endorsement from Tarantino. Tarantino presents those oh, two oh, yeah. words. But it doesn't always work, does it? <laughs> no. he's, he's presented a lot of flops. <laughs> yes, he has. <laughs> I think it was uh, a bit of a cash cow for a while, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I guess one more thing is the comparing it to the Romero films, which people seem to do, and you know, it does invite that with the title, is that Romero seems a lot more interested in the social stories, like the social aspects, like particularly with Dawn of the Dead, you well, know, like the consumerism political... and all, all that sort of stuff, whereas yeah. Wright just kind of lets us do all that. He just keeps the story completely focused on Sean, like even the characters are just you know, there to bring out different aspects of him. Yes. Which I think is... A kind of really masterful and in a way even like a bigger gamble and a more difficult thing to do to be able to you know in, bring zombies in to you know, express this sort of fear in a way that doesn't feel a bit fake or a bit stupid or flippant yeah yeah well romero also made a zombie film like every decade for, there for a while didn't he so and b before he took a, a 20 year break between day of the dead and land of the dead yeah yeah so land of the dead was just after this right I remember going yeah, to see Yeah, it was, it was in, it's part of the same era of zombie movies. Yeah, it didn't, That's right. it didn't hold up well. No, he, it wasn't good. he wanted um, Wright and Penn in that film, I think. They might mm. have had cameos, yeah. I think. Yeah. He wanted them to be, have like, no. leading roles, and they were like, no. Yeah. No, it wasn't good, Jesse, but it was better than the two that he released prior to his death. Diary of the Dead? It was yeah. like a found footage one? He came and, to Melbourne for that. And, oh, okay. really? We got to meet him, yeah. Yeah, right. It was crazy. Oh, wow. In, you know, it was something. crazy. <laughs> oh, well, he was really nice. I bet the whole night was kind of crazy. Yeah. It was like, oh, my God, it's Romero. Yeah, and then even worse was Survival of the Dead, I think it was right. called, um, which was the last one. And apparently he was working on yet another one um, before he passed away. Was it last year that he passed away? Yeah, but yeah. I wonder what yeah. he feels he still has to explore in the genre. Like, oh. what, what more does he have it's to something say? Something that started in the 1960s. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But what but, more is there to say from, from him? I mean, I'm, there's, the zombie genre is interpreted by so many different people in different ways, but by one guy spending his whole career doing zombies, surely he's run out of ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. American yeah. politics is pretty ripe for the idea of zombies voting and stuff like that, maybe. I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's all manner of aspects we could like, <laughs> apply to Well, zombies. in in, yeah. in Land of the Dead, he started exploring further by doing things like introducing this idea that zombies are starting to remember who they were. So, there was like a petrol pump zombie who was still pumping gas, a passing zombie oh, ex okay. extra, but they yeah, were extra. using that to explain that the zombies are remembering. Yeah. Mm. Um, Which we kind of get in this with the character of Noel, that workmate of Sean's, who we mm. see with like in a cutaway scene right at the end, like putting shopping trolleys. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's tiny no, little there's, there's no doubt that's in there. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, and, yeah. and not to mention Ed at the very end as well. Of course. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. that's, that's the big one. Just a bit of trivia here from uh, Sean of the Dead Guys. Uh, when asked by an interviewer why they chose to have slow moving zombies instead of running zombies, Simon Pegg simply replied, because death is not an energy drink. It's a good response. It's <laughs> a great response. <laughs> yeah. Sean tells Liz that he's going to take her to the place that does all the fish. When he opens the phone book, you can see that the restaurant is literally called the place that does all the fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I love that stuff. Uh, just when Sean is exiting the corner shop, which is tuned to a radio station playing songs from Indian movies, the song stops and a newscaster begins speaking in Hindi when translated in English is people are waking up from their graves. <laughs> They put so many of those small little things into this film, in a way. Yeah, it rich, uh, enriches it, for sure. When Sean is heading to the shop for the first time, a worker on the street is listening to the radio. The newscast mentions a space probe that unexpectedly re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and broke up over England. This is likely a reference to Night of the Living Dead, in which radiation from a satellite returning to Venus was given a possible cause for the dead returning to life. So, in relation to what we spoke about before, John and Bernie run the Winchester, these are the real names of the landlord and landlady who used to run Simon Pegg's local pub, the Shepherds in Highgate. John used to make toasted sandwiches for regulars, hence the reference to the Breville Outback. Pegg and Nick Frost were regular attendees of the Shepherds Thursday night quiz, uh, hence the line, we do the quiz, that he says in the film as well. Um, near the beginning of the film, when Ed is playing on the PlayStation 2, 
Sean directs him top left, reload. Good shot. Hey man, listen, um, all top left. Uh huh. I was going to say, reload? I'm on it. Um, since. Oh, no shot. Thanks. When the gang are in the Winchester pub and Sean is firing at the zombies, Ed repeats exactly what Sean instructed him to do in the game Time Splitters 2. Top left! Uh, reload! I'm on it! See, it's just such perfection. The writing. Yeah. 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 So even, many callbacks. Yeah. Even that time that he says the same thing three times, it's like Bloody Mary, bite of the king's head, shots at the Winchester, which is exactly what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so great, isn't it? Yeah. It's perfect. Um, Sean berates Ed for calling the creatures zombies. Any zombies out there? Don't say that. What? That. What? That. The Z word. Don't say it. Why not? Because it's ridiculous. All right. Are there any out there, though? This alludes to the curious fact that many of the most iconic zombie movies, including Night of the Living Dead and Resident Evil, never use the word zombie at all. It can also be a reference to Danny Boyle, director of 28 Days Later, and his insistence that it isn't a zombie movie. Mm -hmm. The Walking Dead, the TV show as well, guys, that does uh, great things, um, never refers to them as zombies. Mm -hmm. They're walkers in that show. Depending on what faction of people you're with, they all have different names for them. Yeah. Mm. But I just like the way that, yeah, Sean berates Ed in this film for Mm -hmm. calling them zombies. (laughs) Don't say that. (laughs) It's it's good. I like it. The rifle they use in the Winchester is naturally a Winchester Model 66. It is also the same weapon used in Night of the Living Dead and its 1990 remake. Mary, the zombie in Sean's backyard, works at Landis Supermarket. This is a nod to John Landis, uh, who directed American Werewolf in London and, of course, Michael Jackson's Thriller. Mm -hmm. in 1983 and to the british chain of convenience stores named londis apparently as well so as this is the first part of the unofficial three flavors cornetto trilogy the red wrapper or strawberry flavor makes its appearance in this film according to edgar wright red represents the blood and zombies which is the main motive of the film obviously and for wright's other films hot fuzz it was blue and vanilla flavor representing the police while the final part, The World's End, it was green and peppermint, representing science fiction and extraterrestrial elements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. I love that. It's very cool. It's very, very cool. According to Edgar Wright, the reason that Cornettos appear in the film is because he once ate a Cornetto to get over a hangover and thought it would be funny if Ed did the same thing after a night of drinking. In March 2011, the film was voted by BBC Radio 1 and BBC Radio 1 Extra listeners as their second favorite film of all time behind The Shawshank Redemption, which came in at number one. That is really strange. Yeah. Shaun of the Dead, number two. <laughs> Just yeah, like I said, I mean, it, it plays better in the UK. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They are held in very high regard. <laughs> um, according to Edgar Wright in the DVD commentary, when Ed attempts to cheer Sean up at the Winchester with plans of binge drinking, he's actually summarizing the events of the next day, or Z-Day, entirely in drinking references. Bloody Mary, check out girl. Bite at the King's Head, Philip. Couple, David and Di. Little Princess, Liz, <laughs> Stagger Back, Impersonates Zombies, and Bar for Shots, Firing the Rifle. You know, that's great. Mm-hmm. That's the last bit of trivia there. That's that's a real highlight. And they took that to the extreme in, in uh, The World's End, where all of the pub names represent the little mini story that goes on at each pub. Oh, yeah. And it's very, very clever. Yeah. In regards to the DVD, Blu-ray, or Ultra HD releases of Shaun of the Dead, there was the 2004 DVD and the 2009 Blu-ray. It also saw a limited release, Andrew, on the now defunct HD DVD format Mm. in uh, 2007. So, Shaun of the Dead infects Blu-ray with a helping of bonus materials headlined by a quartet of commentary tracks. Four of them. That's uh, that's intense. (laughs) That is, isn't it? Particularly when you look at who's involved as well. So the first featuring Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright is the most balanced of them by far. Like, if you're only going to listen to one, listen to this one, okay? Though it takes on an incredibly humorous tone with some true laugh-out-loud moments and even some obviously tongue-in-cheek observations, the duo deliver a track that also includes plenty of insight into the film. It's really funny and informative. It's often as comical as the movie And so if you are a fan, you should listen to this. It's one of the good commentary tracks. Track two features Peg along with fellow actors Nick Frost, Dylan Moran, Kate Ashfield, and Lucy Davis. As a group commentary, it takes on a non-too-serious tone, but it's not quite as gut-busting as the first. Mm -hmm. And then they get really odd for the the next two. Um, Actors Bill Nye and and Penelope Wilton is on there together on the third one. They play Sean's parents, well, his mum 
and his stepdad. Mm. It's the driest and least entertaining of the four. Don't bother with this one, guys. But I don't know why they bothered, to be honest. How much can they say? Well, Bill, Bill Nye is a very popular man. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, it, it would appeal to, to other people. It's not as strange as track four, though, Andrew. Uh, features the film Zombies, a collection of background characters that play zombies throughout the film. <laughs> what is it, just a collection uh, of moans? <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like, oh, this bit's good. Yeah, I, that was great. Yeah, yeah, look what I do in this shot. You know, like and who, oh, who man, voiced no. these zombies? Yeah, who voiced um, them? Do you know? Spaced fan club members. A, really, a lot of them. Oh, really? They came from. The, they were. There was a shout out beforehand. That's like cool. friends of friends when I was living there were like, "Oh, my mate's going to be in the next in this film." You know, sort of thing. It was a big cultural thing. But did they come back for the commentary? Oh, they must have. To, I'm guessing by the sounds of. It, I didn't even realize there was this track. But um, yeah, so <laughs> that's who. That's who comprised most so, of the zombies. Yeah, so mm. four commentary tracks for Shaun of the Dead. You yeah, know? I think it must have been a, a, a gag of theirs as well. Oh, surely. But Just to say, look, this is ridiculous, but let's do it anyway. There are other ways to watch the film, thanks to Universal uh, Pictures Home Video as well, Jesse. Um, you Control was something that they added to their early Blu-ray releases. Mm -hmm. um, so things pop up on the screen while you're watching it. Yeah. Um, I've watched a couple of movies like that. Not this one, though. Yeah. Scene-specific storyboards superimposed over the image. And then a Zombometer, um, a pop-up trivia track as well. <laughs> So, yeah, lots and lots of different ways to watch Shaun of the Dead. They definitely catered to fans mm. well, that's it. Like, with this that, If you uh, think release. about that, the time it came out, that was like, the I guess, the, the main time that Blu-ray and, and special features was at it was its a big deal. peak. So, yeah. like, it was when people were just like, I'm going to spend the whole day, you know, listening and watching to special features. But yeah. it's a bit but, of a dated thing now, maybe. Yeah, but these U-Control things were Blu-ray exclusive as well. Yeah. They could do things. So, it's perfect timing for, yeah. for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Moving past the U Control features, viewers will find Missing Bits, which is a collection of 15 scenes with extended footage and optional filmmaker commentary. And there are stacks of other things on here, guys, that really cater to the fans. Outtakes, Simon Pegg's video diary, casting tapes, makeup tests, featurettes, galleries, trailers. You know, it's got everything on there. If you're a fan, mm. definitely check this stuff out. There's a great feature on there about the writing of the film. Which is- Do you recall that one where they're, um, Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright are standing there with their sort of big butcher paper- stand and they're revealing each page and showing their original notes when they were breaking down the story beats and it has sort of alternate scribblings of what the story might have been it just yeah, shows right. their process it's that's really cool. fascinating that's they, really they cool. walk you through it in detail without without sort of skipping over it yeah that's really cool i like that um there's a plot hole special feature as well um which basically comic book sequences three scenes um there's uh where sean went after he lured all the zombies away from the pub door they actually poke fun here at the fact that the zombies are so slow that they can be outrun and any open terrain, which is the reason why the characters spend so much time indoors as well. Two, um, what Diane did when she ran out of the pub door. And three, how Sean got Ed from the pub cellar into his shed, apparently. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> also streaming wise, guys, if you do uh, use Netflix or Stan, you cannot get Sean of the Dead here in Australia anyway. Mm -hmm. Andrew, the score for Shaun of the Dead, the composers are Daniel Mudford and Pete Woodhead. Yes. Yes. What can you Famously. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, yeah. kind of uh, obscure guys, these guys. Like, not, not a lot of known about them, but um, what they do achieve in the film, I think, is really effective. It's a very... Uh, kind of modern score really it's kind of um lots of beats and and textures and electronic kind of noises and nods i think they actually sample a lot of scores from um from fulci's um films they do which is quite a, like the a, very a opening clever. that's a great opening that musical yeah. note isn't yeah. it yeah like yeah. a synthesized sound isn't yeah. It? Like, yeah it's yeah, really it's cool great. so yeah. what's that, do you know what that's from exactly i don't know which which film exactly yeah. but yeah like it's just it's a very effective score like it you know it plays quite straight really it's, it's not really a, i mean it's a couple of zany tracks that, that, that come out but um, it's it's a pretty straight kind of dramatic dark sounds that they create and it, it just a sense of ominousness throughout the film with their uh, kind of minimalist electronics which I think is very effective. Do you have any highlight parts of the score? Or I think it's I mean I, yeah, I like the um, you know in, in the film as well just the little kind of uh, implication scenes you know where he's doing his day job and he just sees some weirdness where there's like the homeless guy eating a bird you know in the park and <laughs> the scoring of that i think is just you know it creates this tension you're kind of like waiting for the inevitable to happen and the, the scoring of that's very, very well yeah good. i think the best way to score these films is to not play the gag absolutely you know Absolutely. Um, you play the, the horror. Well, you, you know, know a so, good example is uh, we've discussed it on the Ghostbusters. Definitely. Film, Elmer Bernstein just playing it utterly straight, and it's so much fun funnier as a result. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. 
brilliant. Just a That's simple, a good example, simple thing to do. There was also a 23 track score and song compilation album. Yeah, yeah not a, one of my favourite things that they do. I must say, particularly when they put the dialogue in there. It yeah. is contentious. It is contentious, and it really uh, annoys. Like it's, it's kind of. I guess the first time you listen to it, it's kind of like, oh yeah, I remember the scene. It's a funny scene. It's a good dialogue, but in terms of like future listens, it really <laughs> hinders it because it's just constantly interrupted by uh, by the dialogue another soundtrack to do this in a slightly different way is blade runner now we won't talk that much about the blade runner music yeah, yeah. until we look at the film blade runner yeah but um oh but in, in, in uh, tarantino's soundtracks have yeah are you talking about like got... that where it's in between the tracks or is it overlaid it's overlaid like, overlaid that's annoying yeah because the tarantino the ones album. are isolated at least yeah that's right and and it, it's a shame because it's quite nicely done like they actually blend the the score and the songs together because there's quite a bit of Remixing of like the Chicago song that's on the the jukebox, and uh, even um, Grandmaster Flash is kind of remixed, and there's all this blending going on in the actual soundtrack release, which would be really cool to listen to without the dialogue over the top of it. It's a shame, so isn't it? It's mm. a bit of a missed opportunity, but um, well, that's that's not what people get soundtracks for. No, I don't think so. No, I mean I think it, it yeah. had it's had a little bit of a, a moment with Tarantino, and I think that they've followed on with that. But I think they very quickly learned that people don't want that. You, you, watch, you watch the movie for the, for the I, dialogue. If, if it came out today, I don't think it would be there. I yeah. wonder if the Baby Driver soundtrack does it because that was so Not full sure. of music. No, that doesn't. That's doesn't just do got it? a bunch of cracking tunes. Okay. Well, <laughs> not everybody loves it. <laughs> I did want to talk about the sound, like the, the because of so many of the gags. Actually, this is a question I had for everybody here. It was like, do you find this film scary? No, I don't find any um, film scary. What? I have a very high threshold. Bulls. I didn't even find the actors so scary <laughs> watching it recently. I, I I want to be scared. That's why I love horror movies because I want to be scared. I want to feel something. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but no, no. right. Okay. Especially, make, especially not this one. Yeah. The the, the forced yeah. jump scares that they put in there as well. Like well, this the, is what I was thinking with the sound because yeah. like the reveal of uh, Peter Sarabenitz's character through the shower curtain is accompanied by because you have like you know quite gentle mm-hmm. conversational thing. Then bam, when the hand comes out, and that's like the jump scare. But so much of that uh, this time watching it. The only time, a couple of times, I was remotely found it scary was with, with because of the soundtrack. Yeah, because I just bring that burst of score through. Mm. So, you, so yeah, so the film wasn't scary at all, at all. other than no. just sound bursts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like, which is the easiest? Something yeah. gruesome about someone getting uh, a chunk of their flesh being uh, ripped out of their from someone's mouth. Uh, it is a mm-hmm. kind of gruesome thing you always see, uh, but uh, I guess it's such a cl- it's a, not a cliche, but it's a classic. Yeah, it trait. is. It's, it's nice to have that tactility that you tend not to get now so much with horror films these days. Yeah. yeah, with so much reliance on visual effects. Yeah, definitely. digital blood. Yeah. Apparently, there was a comic strip that was developed after this uh, this film came out. Peg and Wright also scripted a one off tie in comic strip for the British comic magazine 2000 AD titled There's Something About Mary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Obviously, the famous zombie in this film. Um, set the day before the zombie outbreak, the strip follows and expands on the character of Mary, who appears briefly in the introductory credits and is the first zombie whom Sean and Ed are aware of and details how she became a zombie. It features expanded appearances from many of the minor or background characters who appear in the film. The strip was made available on the DVD release of Sean, along with two other strips that wrap that plot hole in the film yeah i assume none of you guys have uh, checked out this uh, comic strip unless you've as i said yeah. it's on the disc it rings a bell because i would have watched all the features years ago so yeah. now that you're mentioning it i r- recall it yeah just a fun little like little spin-off thing isn't mm-hmm. it you know yeah. it, it is fun like for fans of the film there's no doubt about that now apparently as well we don't talk that much about merchandise these days on real chat but in 2006 the National Entertainment Collectibles Association announced that it would be producing action figures based on the film as part of its cult classics line that features fan favorite characters from various genre films. The releases so far from Shaun of the Dead are a 12 inch Shaun with sound, mm-hmm. <laughs> a 7 inch Shaun, which was released in Cult Classics Series 4. The sculpt was based on the 12 inch figure, a Winchester 2 pack featuring 7 inch versions of Ed, and a bloodied up Shaun uh, with the Winchester rifle. And then Zombie Ed, <laughs> which is a re deco of the Winchester Ed to be released in Cult Classics Hall of Fame, apparently. So, have you guys seen any of these? I have. You have it, one. It must be the 12-inch. You but have I, don't, one. I don't remember it making sense. Yeah, I have it. It's him standing there with a cricket bat. And it's about, you know, I thought it was about 30 centimeters tall. But yeah. I don't recall it making sounds. It's realistic. And it's cool. Yeah. It's on my desk. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea that you had a collectible from yeah. Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, I bought it back yeah. in the day. Oh, cool. I like Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. <laughs> 
with good reason too. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, we don't talk about the um, the collectibles as much as we used to on the show. But uh, this is what I love about genre cinema is that you can you can take you can take such a simple image of a guy in a white shirt, a bit of blood splatter, and a cricket bat. There's not much to that on paper and a little name tag, but it's just so iconic to this film. And yeah, I love the genre of films make icons out of people. Yeah, yeah it's just, very mundane things, yeah, and then it's something yeah. you want to own on your desk. It's such a weird thing. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Like Ash with a chainsaw for a, an arm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright consider the sequel that would replace zombies with another monster, but wisely decided against it as they were pleased with the first film as a standalone product and thought too many characters died in order to continue the story of this film. Um, the proposed title was From Dust Till Sean. <laughs> oh, good name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would have liked that. Yeah. Same. So this brings us nicely, guys, into sequel, prequel, remake, reboot, or leave it alone. Andrew? A bit of trivia. I actually just remember that I served Simon Pegg when I was working at uh, Borders in London. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? It wasn't very funny. Oh, really? This, this, this <laughs> what point? was he buying? I think it was just a magazine. What year was this? 2006. Okay, okay so a couple so, of years after this. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. he made it and he was all, you know, I'm a big deal. And he just didn't want to talk to me. Which magazine? He just wanted me to run his magazine through. Uh, I can't remember. Did you attempt to talk to him? I didn't. I was just kind of like, you know, he, he looked exhausted. Yeah, as <laughs> yeah, you would. Right. As he, you would. he just he looked like he, he, you know, he just wanted to buy a magazine and fuck off. So, mm -hmm. I can understand that. Yeah. Bit trivia for you there. Yeah. Um, Sequel, prequel, remake, reboot, or leave it alone. I reckon I could do another one. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I can, you know, it's, it lends itself to a follow up. You know, maybe, you know, they, they, they tend to get a bit nostalgic in, in about 15, 20 years. They kind of go back and revisit these characters. So, yeah, I could see that happening. It's interesting because they would probably classify Hot Fuzz and World's End as being the follow ups in their mind, wouldn't they? Yeah. You know, but I would still so, love to see a direct follow up. Yeah. I think it might be the first chance we have at another Cornetto trilogy film. Yeah, right. Because the trilogy is done. Are they going to team up for another one, all three of them? I don't know. But th that would be a great reason. From Dust Till, Sh Till Sean, I would love to see that. Yeah, I so think good. most of us would. Yeah. yeah, would you agree with that, Andy? Yeah, the prequel already exists. It's called Spaced. So yeah. I'm <laughs> all on board for this Dust Till Sean idea. Yeah, it's right. a cracker. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, no, I think we can all agree on that. Um, there were no Academy Awards or nominations, no Golden Globe Awards or nominations for Shaun of the Dead. Uh, the ones that we do need to bring up are the nominations at the BAFTA Awards, uh, being a British film in 2005. It was a nominee Best British Film, uh, the Alexander Corder Award, apparently, um, to Nara Park and Edgar Wright for this film. This is a, a strange one, but maybe a bit of a sign of the times as well, Andrew. Um, a BAFTA Interactive Award. <laughs> So it's very different from the Oscars and stuff. For the DVD release of this film. Wow. Yeah. Um, Full of commentaries. <laughs> and with the nomination going to Universal Pictures and The Pavement, who developed it, apparently. Jesus. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't read that out much because you never see it that I often. It did not exist. That's right. It was also nominated the Carl Foreman Award for the most promising newcomer to Nara Park, the producer, as well. Mm. Okay. So, yeah. What did she go on to do? Do you know? I'm not sure. Okay. Also, we don't bring them up as often as we used to, but the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy and Horror Films was the winner of the Saturn Award for Best Horror Film mm -hmm. in 2005. There you go. Um, the Rotten Tomatoes website certifies Shaun of the Dead fresh with a score of 92%, 187 positive and only 17 negative. And it has an audience score also very high of 93% with an average rating of 3.9 out of 5. And a very good IMDb score, 8 out of 10. Very, very high. So, guys, the top 100. Does this deserve to be there? And is number 89 a fitting position for it? Andrew? I don't think it should be there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I don't think it's in the greatest 100 films of all time. Okay, yep. Great fun. Great in the, in the best pizza and beer movies of all time. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just... We're talking about exclusive list here, so it is. It's uh, it's yeah. it's, uh, it's next to some pretty amazing films. So you know, very entertaining film, but yeah, it doesn't belong there. Yeah, think. it's going to get more and more ruthless as we go along because now we're in the second ten. Yeah. So when films like this, you don't classify it being in there. It's that. It's, it's unfair as well because it's uh, it's just a film. It's just it's just existing there. It doesn't it, you know claim yeah. to be anything, but we yep. put it in these lists and yep. you know it's not their fair fault. point. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, Jesse. It's hard for me to say. It's one of my favorites. I really enjoy it. It's hard to say whether it belongs in there or it doesn't because i agree but what would make me edge it in and keep it there is the fact that it's one of the best examples of its genre so yep. other, other horror comedy you've got sam raimi's stuff which is really good this is arguably more refined and more sort of on point uh so i would keep it there for that just that it's probably the best of its kind yep good one yeah i'd agree um i don't know if it would be in the 100 best but in the 100 most rewatchable or enjoyable i'd probably put it around where, where it is 
And yeah. that seems to be more the tendency that, that people are voting on this, looking through the list of the films. It's, it's a good rewatch and perfect beer and pizza film. It exactly. is. I think that sums it up perfectly. Um, I, I tend to agree with all of you. I think I really, really enjoy this film. Whether you put it in the top 100 or not, I think... Uh, Wouldn't be a cheese and Chardonnay film, would it? Wouldn't be one of those. Probably being up here in the 80s is probably... If you're going to put it in there, it, it should be on the, you know around this area probably but yeah it's a difficult one as much as i like it as well and we're about to get to the scores as well in the top 100 very difficult i don't think we've answered that really <laughs> <laughs> i don't well, think we need but, to well no it, <laughs> i would like to see a geographic breakdown of the vo voters for this um, empire top 100 yes. how many how many are british yeah because yeah good yeah, point anyway. very good point yeah. and I, I wonder what our american listeners think Tell them to post on Facebook. Actually, you know what? I'm going to call out the UK listeners as well. Okay. Probably not, not as many as there are from the US, but um, I'd love to hear from you guys. Let us know about, like, you know, whether you would all put Shaun of the Dead into your top 100 films. Is this, is this the first British film in the, in the list yes, that we've done? It yeah, is. there you go. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good to have a, a different country in there, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is so, a very British film. Indeed. Mm. So we'll wrap this up with our traditional five star review system per guest. So I'll start over here as usual with uh, Mr. Andrew McCaskill. Yes, as has as been discussed, very enjoyable, a lot of fun, good pop culture film, would go down well with a pizza and beer, uh, three stars from me. Good stuff. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Jesse? Yeah, for me, it's the pinnacle of modern horror comedy, and it just gets it right. So, I'm going to give it a solid four stars. Great movie, and always yep. rewatchable. Good stuff. Thanks, yeah, hard Jesse. agree. I'm on the four stars as well. Yeah. Well, it sounds like... That's going to be three lots of four stars, because that's what I'm going to be giving it as well. I guess the main reason I love it is that of all horror movies, the zombie sub-genre is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, Edgar Wright sent us zombie fans a love letter with this film. That love letter is packed to the rafters with homages, nods, and references to horror in general, and zombies in particular. There are even tributes tucked away in the soundtrack with acts such as I, Monster, and Zombie Nation, plus music from the original Dawn of the Dead as well. A lot of the things that really make this film shine for me are in the script, which is just so intuitive and smartly written. All of the hilarious foreshadowing in the first act, the sharp back and forth between characters and the genuine heart that the film reveals in its final act is fantastic. It also allows for a perfect pace, which is also achieved in part due to great editing and Edgar Wright's inventive scene transitions. Usually with comedy films, I despise the stereotypical final act shift into melodrama, one of my pet hates in film, where all the laughs dry up and it has to get serious for its message at the end. Here, though, it elevates the film into something special with some moving moments and very satisfying character development for Sean. Some of the more subtle commentary on British suburban life is also pretty apt and gives the film a little extra merit. The other big reason for my endless love and admiration, this movie is wickedly funny and incredibly smart. Peg and Wright aren't just fans, they're uber fans. They know movies and music and pop culture. They know film cliches and they know how to incorporate them into a gently mocking way to make something fresh. They didn't just make a horror comedy. They made a romantic horror comedy buddy action coming of age flick. <laughs> <laughs> there are numerous visual audio and dialogue clues that hint at events to come. There are inside jokes, inside, inside jokes. There are references to Edgar Wright's space TV show beyond just features featuring three of the principal actors from that show. This is cinematic ratatouille of many layers that demands multiple viewings and rewards the geekiest of fans who do. So, yeah, four stars from me. Highly recommended, guys. So so that's it, guys. Well said. So yeah. thank, thank you very much for coming and indulging and talking Shaun of the Dead with us. And um, Hot Fuzz is part of the top 100. It's much higher up on the list than this one is. But The World's End isn't. But I would like to look at it at some stage on Real Chat, just so we can close that loop sure. somewhere. We'll have a look at it. So, um, so yes, I'd like to have a, a special thanks as well to our guest, Andy. Thank you very much for having me. It was an honour to come on and chat about it. No worries at all, mate. No worries. Hopefully you'll come back and visit us again sometime. And, yes. um, and um, thank you again, I'll Jesse. Thank you. And uh, Andrew, thank you. Thank you very much. 